بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد My dear and respected brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته I welcome you all to our weekly hadith circle We are reading a hadith sayings of our beloved Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم from Riyadh al-Salihin We are on hadith 58 from Kitab al-Sidq which is the chapter on truthfulness we have this quite long tradition. I always obviously read those uh, hadith in Arabic. I'll do the same today. We'll read the translation, but it's like a story, so inshallah, it should be no problem to follow and to understand this. An Abi Huraira radiallahu anhu qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Gaza nabiyun min al anbiya'i salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhim faqala li qawmih. لا يتبعني رجل ملك بضع امرأة وهو يريد أن يبني بها ولما يبني بها ولا أحد بنى بيوتا لم يرفع سقوفها ولا أحد اشترى غنما أو خلفات وهو ينتظر أولادها فغزى فدنا من القرية صلاة العصر أو قريبا من ذلك فقال للشمس إنك مأمورة وأنا مأمور اللهم احبسها علينا فحبست حتى فتح الله عليه فجمع الغنائم فجاءت يعني النار لتأكلها فلم تطعمها فقال إن فيكم غلولا فليبايعني من كل قبيلة رجل فلزقت يد رجل بيده فقال فيكم الغلول فلتبايعني قبيلتك فلزقت يد رجلين أو ثلاث بيده فقال فيكم الغلول فجاءوا برأس مثل رأس بقرة من الذهب فوضعها فجاءت النار فأكلتها فلم تحل الغنائم لأحد قبلنا ثم أحل الله لنا الغنائم لما رأى ضعفنا وعجزنا فأحلها لنا متفق عليه So Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه reported that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said One of the earlier prophets who was out on an expedition he proclaimed among his people that no man should follow him who had married a woman with whom he wished to cohabit but had not yet done so yet or who had built houses on which he had not yet put the roofs like he's just about to finish the building or who had bought sheep or pregnant she camels and was expecting them to produce the young ones. He then went on the expedition or a war and approached the town at the time of Asr prayer or just a little before it. He then told the son that both the son and he were all under command and he prayed to Allah to hold it back for them. So the son was held back until Allah gave them the victory. He then collected the spoils of the war and the fire came to eat these, devour these. But it didn't. The spoils of war, the booty. He said that among the people there was a man who stole something from the entire booty. He told them that a man from every tribe must swear allegiance to him shake his hand and when a man's hand stuck to his hand then he would say I have a feeling that there is a thief among you your tribe so every individual of your tribe must swear allegiance to me and in course of swearing allegiance hands of two or three people from that tribe stuck to his hand then he said the thief is certainly amongst you amongst these men. They brought him a head of gold like a cow's head and when he laid it down the fire came again 
and this time he did devour the spoils, like he did basically burn the booty. Spoils were not allowed, then the Prophet says, to anyone before us. Then Allah allowed the spoils of war to us, as he saw our weaknesses and incapacity, and therefore he allowed the booty to us. Basically, he allowed us to make the use of booty. Muttafaqun alayh means, obviously, Bukhari and Muslim both recorded this uh, hadith in their respective works. Now, we always look at the language of this tradition, or every tradition. Uh, there is maybe a couple of terms, or maybe more, I, I could point out. The first one is the fact that the hadith says, Nabiyun, a prophet, one of the earlier prophets. So ulama obviously analyzed this tradition and they tried to answer. So Imam Suyuti is of the opinion, he suggests that he figured out which prophet it was. So he says it was the prophet Yusha ibn Nun. Yeah? So Suyuti, uh, Imam Suyuti, the great scholar of Islam, believes that it was prophet Joshua or uh, uh, Yusha ibn Nun. Yeah? Uh, he, he was the one that, that all this happened to. So sometimes we have in a tradition, uh, in some traditions, a man or a lady or a person or a place, and then the ulama tried to define for us who the person was, if possible. And we said many times in the past in our circle, even the times when we are not able to conclude who the person it was, who was the person in, in, in question, it doesn't take away from the tradition, including this one. Even if we are not 100% sure, and we are not, and we are wrong, maybe it wasn't Jusha ibn Nun, it was another prophet from the past, yeah, previous prophets, it doesn't make a big difference for us and what we learn from this tradition. But this is a, 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 a linguistic issue, and most scholars basically try to solve it. Okay, so this is one issue. Uh, the other issue is min al qariya So uh, when he was close to, was approaching uh, the town, and then here it was not a town, it was a known place, yeah, place that was known. al qariya yeah, so with la mutarif. So there are again scholars who looked at it and they said, most likely, most probably, it was the town of Ariha. Okay, Jericho. So, Allahu Alam, I can't say conclusively, but we have no reason to also not to believe that it was Joshua, uh, Yusha ibn Nun, and that he basically was about to enter Ariha. Okay, uh, so these are all language issues, but interesting one. And this term, uh, which is mentioned later on uh, after that, Falem Tat Amha. Okay. So, uh, this term has been used, it, it could have been said lam ta'akulha, or you can say lam tahriqha, any one of that. So basically the fire didn't burn the booty, didn't take, didn't consume, or uh, devour the booty, the spoils of the war. So a specific term was used here, and it is important because, as you can see, it's a symbolic uh, meaning of whether the booty or the offering, we should say, were accepted by God or not. Whenever Allah accepted the offering, which, uh, let's say, believers in God or people at that time would offer him, the uh, spoils would be burnt, like the fire would come and consume it. If the fire didn't come or didn't consume it, that was a bad sign. That was a meaning that something was wrong. Yeah, with the offering. So that's why this term was used. And uh, the, the other term, which is probably the hardest of all of them, which needs to be pointed out, is غُلُولًا uh, yeah? So he said, فِيكُمْ الْغُلُول Like once or twice in this tradition. So what does that mean? It means الْخِيَانَ فِي الْغَنِيمَ So basically, cheating. Somebody, as you can see, some of them, like I don't know how many soldiers were there, but one or two or maybe three of those whose hands uh, stuck, 
basically uh, to the Prophet's hand, Joshua's hand, uh, they all together stole something from the booty. Or maybe one of them and the others helped him, whatever. So basically, he just said, Fikum al Ghulul, which meant someone from your tribe or somebody from belonging to your tribe, when he shook the hands of, let's say, the, the chiefs of each tribe, the leaders of each tribe, he then obviously learned, oh, right, this person, his hand, I had a feeling something is wrong with his tribe and men from his tribe. Then he said, okay, now I order every single member of your tribe to shake my hand as well or give renew your allegiance to me. And then he, he figured out who the thieves were. So what it means, al-ghululan, means khiyana, betrayal. Okay? So somebody was cheating because in the past, as you understand from this hadith, whatever were the spoils of the war, yeah, or the expedition, the entire booty had to be given back as an offering, really like an offering. And the whole thing would be basically eaten up by fire, basically burnt by fire. So they couldn't benefit, they couldn't take anything from the booty, whether it's gold, silver, precious metals, or whatever it is, you know, they had to basically give that as an offering to Allah. And Allah will take that, and in that way He will, he will basically show to them that their intentions in fighting or offering uh, their sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are pure, sincere, genuine. When the booty or the spoils wouldn't be uh, burnt, okay, consumed by the fire, that means they were not honest, therefore Allah didn't want their booty or didn't want their offering. So, as you can see, this prophet of Allah, who was most probably Joshua, uh, Yusha ibn Nun, he didn't want that. He didn't want everyone to suffer. He, he sensed the, what the problem could be. So he was searching and finding out why would Allah not accept their offering from them after that particular expedition. So he basically discovered where the gulul was, where the betrayal was, who stole something from the booty, or took part of it, basically stole part of it, okay, without uh, his knowledge or without uh, knowing that it's impermissible or not allowed, without anybody's awareness or knowledge of it. But he discovered who it was. So basically he then solved it and then the, the spoils were or the sacrifice or the offering uh, was accepted by Allah and Allah rewarded them for their efforts and took their offering as well in return. So this all came from this term ghulul, fikum al ghulul, which means al khiyana fil ghanima, betrayal uh, when it comes to the spoils of war. Apart from this, uh, maybe there's one more term which Imam Nawawi also suggested we should point out, which is al khalifatu, bi fatih al khai al mu'jama wa kasri lam, wa huwa jam khalifa, wa hiya al naqatu al hamil. Of course. This is a difficult term, I agree with Imam Nawi, no doubt about it. The reason why it's not difficult for us, because when we read the translation, uh, it was no issue because the people who did, who did uh, translate this tradition, they did an excellent job, and they even said here, pregnant she camel. And that's exactly what this means. Of course, it's in a plural form, so pregnant she camels. Yeah, uh, Al-Khalifatu means... جَمْعُ خَلِفَةً وَهِيَ النَّاقَ الْحَامِلِ Yeah, she camel that is pregnant. So it's amazing, like Arabic language is very comprehensive and eloquent as you understand. There's a spe special term for she camel, yeah, and obviously only she camel will be pregnant. Uh, so there is a plural and singular for she camel that is carrying a little camel or that is pregnant. So, uh, very interesting uh, term as well. Apart from that, I can't see anything else. But let us go to the benefits or uh, lessons from, that we learn from this, uh, from this hadith. Uh, so, we understand from the way that, let's say, he was Prophet Joshua ibn Nun, yeah, Yusha. Uh, Ibn Nun, we understand from this prophet's behavior and the way he dealt with this whole condition. Yeah, it shows that it was necessary to take to make uh, appropriate arrangements. Yeah, for.
for the worldly needs needs of those who are engaged in, in Allah's way, in, in the cause of Allah, so that they can concentrate on their struggle without any distraction. So he did what was needed to be done, okay? And he wanted to make sure that they are fighting uh, in Allah's cause with the purity of intention. And they are not being distracted by the booty itself or the spoils of the war or being attached to the worldly things. And you can understand here like what they brought was a head of gold like, yeah, of gold, like a cow's head. So lots of gold basically, which looked like a cow's head. Okay, so basically they saw something very precious and valuable, gold. They wanted to steal it because they, they were not fully in it, in their religion and in the jihad, in the war. They were interested in booty, basically, in worldly spoils, rather than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thought of them. So he dealt with it in this way because he, want, he didn't want anyone to be distracted when they are fighting in Allah's cause. Now, the next point is the lawfulness of the booty of war fought in the way of Allah is uh, like an exclusive right which belongs to the last ummah, our ummah basically. It seems that before the advent of Islam, the spoils of war, the booty itself, yeah, uh, it was always basically offered to Allah back, given back to Allah as a sacrifice. And the fire, a fire would come and consume it. Basically, it will burn it. So, uh, subhanallah, isn't this a huge privilege to us? You know, like it could, this same rule could have applied to our ummah, our times. But the Prophet explained at the end of his hadith. He says, فَلَمْ تَحِلَّ الْغَنَائِمُ لِأَحَدٍ قَبْلَنَا So the spoils of war were not allowed to anyone before us. It's a clear sentence by the Prophet. And then what did he say? Then Allah allowed spoils of war to us. ثُمَّ أَحَلَّ اللَّهُ لَنَا الْغَنَائِمُ So we need to be grateful to Allah that Allah allowed us to make use of the booty, yeah, spoils of war. Why? And he gave us a reasoning. لَمَّا رَأَى ضَعْثَنَا وَعَجْزَنَا This is a bit scary, but in a way, it's a little bit like reassuring. There's a compensation for it. But because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew our weakness, in a way this means, I'm just telling you, this really means that our nation, our ummah, is in some way or another weaker than the ummah before, the nations, past nations, the nations before us. And we have certain incapacities that they didn't have. Okay, So Allah is basically compensating for this weakness which we have which is greater, bigger, more obvious, okay, uh, <clears throat> than the weaknesses of previous nations by allowing us to make use of the spoils of war. So we are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but at the same time, you know, we need to be aware of our weakness. We need to focus on that, concentrate on that, and not overestimate our abilities. That's the, the second or next point. And of course, فَأَحَلَّهَا لَنَا He said, ضَعْفَنَا وَعَجْزَنَا فَأَحَلَّهَا لَنَا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed this and many other things that were not allowed to the nations before. So therefore we should be indeed grateful. This hadith also teaches us that prophets of the past also had great miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them. So in this case, it seems that Prophet Yusha ibn Nun, Joshua, he had this miracle, okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired him how to figure out what the problem was, where the betrayal was, and why the spoils of war were not taken, why the sacrifice was not accepted from them. So he basically had alama, okay? Allah inspired him to figure out, you're gonna uh, renew allegiance from each uh, leader of each tribe, okay? Uh, the leader of each tribe, and you will have some kind of sign. When you shake their hand, you will understand where the thief comes from and from which tribe. So that's how we figure out which tribe, instead of questioning everyone, one after the other. 
Then he went on to say, I got to basically uh, see every member from your tribe, from their leader or commander. And then when he shook the hands of everyone from that particular tribe, he realized that there was a problem with three particular or two particular people. Then he said, the thief is among you. One of you, if not all of you. Okay. And then he solved the issue and they did come. I mean, they went and they brought the stolen thing. Whatever they stole, they brought it. He added it to the spoils of war that were already there. The fire immediately came and took the rest. Their deeds were accepted from them and their intentions were purified because those people clearly repented. They saw the miracle at the hands of this Prophet of Allah and they obviously apologized, said sorry and gave back what they took. They admitted and acknowledged their mistake. They didn't persist, no, 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 we didn't do it. They recompensated in their own way and as a result Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted everybody's efforts and they were all rewarded accordingly. So that is amazing and uh, this whole hadith in a way, I mean, there are many other benefits we can deduce but uh, in a way it is very amazing and it's very interesting that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe this is the main lesson of this whole hadith, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really wants and what he's looking at is our heart the purity of our intention, the purity of our heart. It's not about the booty itself. Look, even in our case, we can make use of weapons we, we capture, the, the livestock we capture, uh, the food, whatever we capture, gold, silver, jewelry, treasure, whatever we capture, okay? Any resources, vehicles, whatever we capture, we can make use of it. That's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. Not our riches, not our appearance, okay? He wants pure, pure hearts, yeah? Purity of our intention. That is where Allah looks. He doesn't look at our physical shape or our riches and dominions. He wants to look at our hearts. And that's where the true connection between us and our Creator is built. And that's why the Prophet would point with his fingers, index finger, at taqwa ha huna. The true piety lies in your heart. It's here. It's all here. This is the brain and soul of your being. So purify your intention and then remember, whatever you do, waging a war, taking part in an expedition with your prophet or commander, studying Islam, helping somebody poor and needy, looking after an orphan, smiling towards someone, being kind to your parents, spending time with your kids and family, whatever you do, do it for Allah's sake you shall see the difference and you will see the benefits of, of, of your deeds, inshallah ta'ala. There is one more hadith in this whole chapter. You see, this chapter is not anywhere near long uh, to the previous chapter. So let me try to read this one as well, inshallah. It's quite short as well and we'll finish the lesson here. An Abi Khalid, Hakim ibn Hizam, radiyallahu anhu, qala, قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم البيعان بالخيار ما لم يتفرقا فإن صدقا وبينا بورك لهما في بيعهما فإن كتما وكذب محقت بركة بيعهما متفق عليه It's a very more important hadith I mean even the one before is important Hakim ibn Hizam رضي الله عنه reported that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said Listen carefully everyone the Prophet said, peace and blessings be upon him, both parties in a business transaction have a right to annul it, yeah, to cancel the transaction, the deal, so long as they have not separated while they are still in the same session or sitting. And if they tell the truth, okay, it's all about being honest, isn't it, in this chapter, being truthful, and make everything clear to each other, like if there are any faults with the items they are selling, they should tell it, yeah? Say everything, speak the truth, be straight, okay? With regards to the purchase thing. And also the buyer with regards to the money. You know, he shouldn't basically be giving you money that he stole or the money that's not his or fake money. So, the Prophet said, they will both be blessed in their transaction. No doubt. But if they concealed anything, and lied to one another, the blessings of their transactions will be wiped out. Basically, there will be no barakah, no blessing in their transaction. Wallahi, this is very true with 
proper business transactions because the Prophet used the term al bayya means buying and selling, trade. al bayyani bil khiyar But believe me, uh, it doesn't even need to be buying and selling transaction. Any interaction you have doesn't have to be a transaction, which means buying and selling something, giving a good for in return for some other good or money. Okay? Any interaction you have, always be truthful and honest with the person. Don't hide something. You know, be honest. It's very important. You will get the barakah of your interaction. The excellence, the, re- the full reward, the blessing of your interaction, especially with transactions. Let us not fool ourselves and, and, and think we can cheat on people and become rich in that way. Like the famous one in the Quran, cheating on the scale. I'm going to pack packs, I'm going to show exactly 700 grams, but I'm going to tell my manufacturers, my manager, please make sure it's 655 grams. Nobody ever will feel the 50 grams difference. But by million packs, I'm going to cheat on 500 kilograms or 5 tons, and I'm going to make lots of money. The inspectors who inspect the markets will not figure it out. Even their scales might not show the 50 little grams that I cheated on or 20 grams, or 10 grams, and you can go on and on and on and cheat on anything. Beginning from weight, on the quality, not declaring the ingredients, this is another one, declaring false ingredients, claiming there is this and that. It could be all kinds of things. The worst, of course, is that you are basically, you are making up things. And this is what is happening online nowadays with the fraud. People are so-called selling us a wonderful product, There's no such a thing, it's all a fake. So they are selling you nothing, a fake thing, and robbing you off, basically, you know, cheating on you. Secondly, people are saying, I'll give you the money by this date. They took the good, make use of it, resold it, whatever, and they never paid for it. People do all kinds of things when it comes to transactions, buying and selling. Where is the etiquette of Islam? Where is this concept and notion? I want to be blessed in, in every transaction I make. I want to be blessed with every interaction I make in my life with, with someone else. And will you really be so reassured? That person on whom you cheated in your transaction, buying and selling, don't you think he's going to be waiting for you on judgment, judgment, judgment day? And Allah will not forgive you until that person is given their right, their due. People obviously don't even think of Judgment Day when they do things like this. So this hadith is a very last one. Just like these men, two or three men, who stole the thing from the spoils of war. If they, if they, in the end, I mean, they came back to their conscience in a way because they saw a great miracle by their prophet. But they still could have concealed it and kept it. No, 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 it wasn't me. Maybe he will never find out who it was because he, was, he wasn't able to go in every tribe and search every tent. And, and their spoils of war would not be accepted. But they gave it, and everything changed. The same can happen with us. Maybe initially, we wanted to conceal some deficiency or fault in the item we are selling someone, okay, or the money that we are giving. But we come back to our sense during the transaction. Oh, sorry, sorry, brother, I'm selling you my car, but I forgot to tell you, those two tires are really low, and I had a warning already. Please, I'll take off 200 pounds because that's roughly the cost of those two tires because you won't pass the next MOT without purchasing new two tires. I just want to tell you. So if you are honest, while it's still time for transaction, in the same session, you will still gain the barakah. And that's why in Sharia it was very clear. Let's say I, didn't want, I wanted to cheat you. I didn't want to con- you know, uh, uh, declare and, and, and I wanted to conceal. Yeah, I didn't want to... Uh, speak up and be straight and honest. So you sold me a car. Oh, but the clutch is wrong. Fine, I have three days and nights or whatever we have agreed in today's time and age, international transactions, usually we are all given two weeks guarantee. So basically, I'm sorry, brother. I know I paid you for this, but look, we didn't agree you are are selling me a car that, that is the engine is not working or the clutch is not working, whatever, big problem. I'm going to give you your car back. You're going to give me all of my money. If you don't, I'm going to sue you. Like this. And this is Islamic 
fully proper, proper ethical, and we need to understand that. So, you know, please remember this hadith. This is the word of our beloved Prophet wasallam, and he really meant it. If the Prophet told us, if we are honest, okay, truthful when we transact with other people, we will be blessed in our transactions. Don't we want to be blessed with our transactions? Yes, surely we do. And if our Prophet said, you will not be blessed if you conceal something, then know for sure you will not be blessed. Which means even if you made fortune, it's going to haunt you at the end. You're going to collapse, bankrupt, and there will be some issue whereby all the money you cheated on other people and that's how you became rich, you will lose all of that, believe me. So, uh, truthfulness is a means of blessings in the business, while falsehood and hiding of any defects of the merchandise distracts from its blessings. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us truly pious and conscious and earnest in all of our dealings with other people, but especially when it comes to buying and selling, we need to be honest and truthful, and in that way, inshallah, we will see the true blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in whatever we have. Even if it's little, it will actually mean a lot to us. On the other hand, if we are not honest and not blessed in what we have, we might be billionaires or millionaires, but it will feel like we got nothing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, purify our intentions in everything we do, make us truthful at all times and honest, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us our mistakes and shortcomings. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم فاستغفروا إنه الغفور الرحيم سبحانك اللهم نستغفرك ونتوب إليك ونصلي ونسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا بارك الله فيكم والعفو منكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته إلى اللقاء